other difficulties occurring if you take a standard interpretation of what an individual is as being given and useful for all purposes, a uh, sort of biological bag, as it were, uh, on feet, um, is that you neglect um, out of the class of individuals a large number that do exist. And, for example, one I would like to consider as existing is what uh, Imre Lakatos, who was uh, one of Popper's students initially, disagreed with Popper, not in terms of his falsification theory so much as um, in, in terms of with, which is a purely deductive approach to science, essentially. In fact, the only appropriate method once an hypothesis is posed in Popper's philosophy is creativity is outside science. Hypotheses are invented outside science. Science is the subject of the universe, including, of course, the thing that generates creativity, but for the moment, creativity is outside. And um, next, he believes the only proper method, ultimately, for arriving at, uh, uh, at, at good theories uh, is to, to falsify them, either in part or in whole, preferably by the technique of, and using entirely deductive methods for this purpose, so that as much inductive evidence as you like will never affirm a hypothesis, or even support a theory, except in give it brief inductive support. And um, that <coughs> paradigm, in contrast to Reichenbach or somebody who was very much an inductivist in the method of argument, that paradigm is a paradigm employed for pursuing and testing scientific theories. Now, Popper would, um, was surprised, in fact, by Kuhnian revolutions in science, and, and he wouldn't try to account for them. These are typical sort of creative things that occur when you change paradigm, paradigm shifts. Uh, Lakatos brought out a point, uh, amongst many others, that, in fact, a scientific research program, on whatever premises it be based, and perhaps based on a, a falsification criteria for mode of argument within the thing called science about scientific matters, uh, is uh, itself alive. Um, <laughs> that it is a perfectly good sentient being. Um, he used evidence somewhat similar, but historical in nature, rather than um, thematic, uh, from fairly immediate observation, to um, show, in fact, uh, for example, the Ptolemaic theory perpetuated itself in this way. A lot of other theories do, uh, and uh, it goes into great depth in the subject that what happens when you get falsifying evidence, of course, is not a rejection, but is either what you were saying, namely that something or other, what? Not just individual scientists, something or other, what he called a program of scientific research, uh, is rejecting it, or saying it as a finding, or, very often, uh, well, I guess the same thing, really, uh, um, refuting it and converting it by, by converting it into, into, into affirmative evidence. Now, typically when a scientific a school of thought, a scientific research program, is, um, is addressed by a failure, it invests more and more money in trying to support that failure by repeating the experiment with greater precision or something like that. And um, this has been observed with great detail, and uh, it's rather similar to the phenomena which is curious to individual people or to individual groups very often. For example, a group of people who looked at the, uh, the end of the end of the world people, so all the goods, etc., messianic culture, general messianic culture, very good, a very good example of this. Uh, and it is uh, the simplest case, you know, you buy a motor car, uh, having spent a lot of money on it, uh, you, you find this motor car is no good, but you, you, nevertheless, you don't really take the evidence as being no good, uh, assuming it's a new car and a guarantee and so on, etc. 
uh, you don't discover a crashing defect, which in which case you can explain a blue per purchase easily. But when it's a, it's a guaranteed new motor, you explain the defects of this thing um, by, by in fact, either rejecting the evidence or saying, oh, well, it's just the trimming that's come off, or uh, anybody would expect the gearbox to go, or a motor car of this power, or something. I mean, it's just, and, and uh, you don't want to reject mental, cognitive, or or monetary investment. Now, I think, of course, scientific research programs involve all of these. They involve um, they involve joint shared conceptual activity. They, they they embody great apparatuses for getting people to work with, depending on the science, certain kinds of instrument, whether it be Skinner boxes or whether it be um, whether it be centrifuges in biochemistry or whatever, and vast amounts of money are spent in physics on accelerators and similar equipment, and cloud chambers stuck at the end of them somewhere. And um, these are very big investments in money, and they're very big investments in technology, and they're very big versions often of technology instantly, but they, they can also be advancements in technology. Uh, and what is it that's doing all this? Rejection. It isn't actually the individual scientist who's being creative <laughs> or being even perverse. Uh, in a way, the, the whole conduct of science is dependent upon it being an organism which surely requires scientists to, to operate it. The, when it comes to the lamentable conclusion with some sciences like biochemistry and some sorts of particle physics that the whole darn shoot of the deductive inference, at any rate, most of the inductive inference, could be uh, based upon a computer situated after the reactor or whatever it is accelerated and built uh, to process the photographs and reach conclusions as well. Uh, and. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's not difficult to conceive or formulate a few hypotheses. Does this fit? Uh, but there it is. I mean, <laughs> does this fit in your mind? Does this fit uh, compatibly into uh, the language which you are trying yeah, to? Yeah, does indeed. I think study? the whole thing is sort of in a, in in the broadest possible sense of the word, a linguistic phenomenon, uh, because language is not some set of symbols or signs. I did try to stress this earlier, and I think it came over fairly well. It is, uh, nor is it strings of them being uttered, it is a, a phenomena about life and interaction. And it is, it is life and interaction. And um, I think linguists don't get the transformation rules or whatever wrong. I think that they're probably, you know, they're very pretty and beautiful, but they and they're not really addressing language. And formalize language as against to do what is commonly known as formal linguistics nowadays is, for example, to study programs of scientific research, individuals, in many individuals each of us contain, uh, group individuality, our social individuality, our religious, our political, our other individualities, which are equally uh, good distinctions. Um, in their proper position. And this is linguistics. Um, the substrate, the matrix I'm most familiar with, you're most familiar with, is the human brain. Some people would have animal brains as well. I would have animal brains, and actually, because I think Hendrix and the horses, or some of John Lilly's work and his dolphins, and some of Gregory's work, various kinds of organization, most of it. All of it, in fact, probably, is uh, addressing just this point. I'm not yeah. sure that it clarifies things for me, and perhaps I don't like it to see how you, you bring those together. That it, I'm not sure that it clarifies things for me to describe a scientific program, say, as a living, sentient being. Um, it doesn't clarify it because I don't think you understand this language completely. I did a couple of doctorates were submitted from very different points of view. One about Middle East, and one about, uh, I guess we can say, the gas council as well. I think that's fair enough. It's, it's, uh, some of the material is still 
motion of security presents about the gas cows, that's fine, we don't mention the incident. And what these students do are elaborate field studies involving interviews and various kinds of interactions and so forth to substantiate the hypothesis that there were indeed, uh, if one could legitimately call a person an identity and a group of people an identity which shared a common and fully understandable language, then a corporation like the Gas Council, which is a large nationalized body, which could equally well be a commercial body, it's run just like one, well, it's just a universal uh, supplier, really, in the UK. And um, it um, has a language of its own. And there are people who understand it not at all, I guess. They talk to each other inside the organization. They are employed by it by somewhat tenuous bonds. Uh, they're paid money. That's not the main reason to stay there, actually. As you, anybody knows, I guess, in the industry. It's, it's seldom the case that people <coughs> go there just because they're paid money. I mean, they like to get paid money. They strike because they're not paid money. And fine. But, I mean, the fact is that they... Uh, they have social aims and all sorts of other aims in going to that place. And the office, although not a phenomenon I particularly like, has a social practice and is essential to the running of a decent office, and this should be respected. Um, whether offices are necessary now becomes a little questionable in many cases, I agree, but uh, this is due to technological advances which make it possible to uh, have the social functions attached to a particular occupation with a pride and so forth and work uh, distributed rather than geographically distributed rather than localized. Uh, among the people, however, who do partly understand this language, and I know none who do, um, the, um, they're called brilliant managers. They are a, a curious phenomenon prized by by the industry as a whole, uh, unexplicated. Uh, they may be individual people or they may have to work in concert because they're clearly <coughs> processing things which cannot be processed in the medium of one particular compact brain <coughs> which requires to be executed cooperatively in several they're executing procedures that have to be shared. Depends a little bit on the situation. I give a side example of both and of how, for example, various disasters in this, in a sense, dangerous industry, because you've got great tubes of gas under pressure and stuff all over the place in the middle of the city and whatnot, were avoided by actions of this sort, and how some were not avoided. And uh, furthermore, I have evidence that within these organizations, there are, if you like, sub-organizations, I'm not quite sure what sub means in this context, but they would normally be alluded to as sub-organizations. They're called, typically, departments. They may have a formal or informal status. Both occur. Uh, but they have integrity, have unity of some sort. And they talk to one another, do each other, stand each other. And what we call change and chance is very often just that. Um, I insist that scientific schools and research programs, religions and the like, have a similar caliber. The other thesis uh, makes it pretty clear if you look at the uh, situation in the Middle East and um, where, in fact, anybody in their senses says, well, the U.S. must back Syria or Jordan as well as Egypt. Now, this is a sort of simple conclusion to arrive at. Uh, it is, a matter of fact, uh, a forecast from this thesis which is a very big one, a very important one. And incidentally, the particular countries to do might change according to the circumstances. What is being said is that if I want to identify a geographical lump with a certain population density, uh, OK, it's one of those two. It's not a particular political preference one way or another or something. Um, but uh, had this happened earlier, a great deal of distress would have been avoided. I suppose my only question really is on the nature of the word yeah, living, I, which yeah. I well, okay, changes. living, all right, I will, I will drop living. I will drop living and say that it's um, a being on a, which has individuality, 
and which is maintaining itself as well as growing. Because it sounds very much like a biological cell. Right? Yeah, it's not like or, a biological or cell, or only organizationally in some way like a biological cell. Or, or an ecological yeah. terrain. Yeah. I mean, could, the descriptions are good. I, I, I'm always troubled when people begin to use the word living in a way that they're really speaking. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, yeah, sure, okay. Well, I should use, I should, get, I guess, I should use the word okay, reserve the word the life. I should reserve the word life for uh, uh, use in uh, protein-based uh, yeah, materials just originating. Priorities. Yeah, okay, fine, I'll do that. In that case, then, living, it is an or an organism. It is a dynamic, a kinetic organism which grows, differentiates and is capable of entering into dialogue. Uh, often they're quite unfamiliar, they must be almost infinitely numbered, there must be many more we don't know than we do know, and this is what linguistics is about, it's a vastly important matter, and to formalize that is a worthwhile endeavor to talk about it's a grammar, I don't think it has a rather parochial interest. What it's about is to try to... I mean, it may be an interesting example, sure. What would you say? Are you saying that what linguistics is about is partly... Yes, so if I want to formalize linguistics, I have to formalize systems of this kind. And, uh, I mean, this, I think, is, is conversation, is, is the essence of conversation. These things do converse. Well, there's a double problem here, isn't there, in that in describing these systems, in some cases, you bring them into existence. You do. You can bring them into existence by describing them. They can also perhaps bring you into existence. Maybe without your knowing it. And uh, that's to say they can give you a certain identity. I don't think they usually copulate and give birth to children to merge down sort of gasometer or something, but uh, that is not the, the intention at all. Uh, it is that you become the person you are very often for reasons you don't know, which you ascribe to fortune or something. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's anything which is undeterministic about these things at all. I'm willing to believe in certain sorts of non-determinism, certainly in determinacy principles. I don't think it's properly applied yet. Uh, Pope very often say, well, no chance had it as for good fortune. Fine, it's a nice turn of phrase, but uh, it means I don't know how. Uh, that's all. And, uh, and how may be perfectly explicit and also incidentally it might be and often is personally understood later um, but uh, and the final one I want to really question of course is this business of temporality so to give some sense to this word finally understood after all for example that um, and see, incidentally none of this denies the rectitude or propriety of any of the other distinctions we're making I mean that are made at all. I mean, it's quite possible to say, well, you know, uh, science is uh, is the application of a certain method or something. True, also in a way. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, science is an organism, and it, it behaves in this, this way, which resembles greatly the way that, that human organisms behave, uh, and. Um, it, uh, it isn't identical, for heaven's sake, it speaks a different language, it's achieved different, a different range of languages available to it. Um, there can be some overlap. Uh, it, uh, this is no more absurd or, or ridiculous than saying, well, I have a limited degree of communication with dogs and elephants. Some people have got the knack of it, and those who spend a lot of their effort with dogs and elephants, or depend upon them a great deal, mutually, they even come to learn the special languages which are mutually understandable by dogs and elephants and people. It's rather a different gimmick to let's try and teach learning human language to chimps or something, uh, which may or may not be possible, I don't know, it's a different endeavor at all. And, uh, you having problems? Uh, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, there are two things that are occurring to me. But, um, let me take the first one. Gordon, could you speak a bit about your understanding of Warren McCullough's understanding of abductive? You've spoken about yeah. deductive, you've spoken about inductive. I do. 
And what, what, uh, what does the term and, and the concept abductive mean to you? Um, it means uh, the creative aspect of a dialectic process, which is what it meant to, to Warren, uh, means to Warren still. Um, and it is um, to be identified, I guess, as follows. Historically, it is set in the context of the moment when the word induction, which was, I suppose, middle Renaissance, the late Renaissance, uh, became reserved for one part only of what induction previously meant. Um, that is to say, there used to be induction of hypotheses, and this was common both in early thought of all civilizations that were looked at, and also in the Middle Ages even, and there was admitted to be induction of hypotheses, and then induction from exemplars, which could be either pieces of authority, the authority of the ancients, according to um, Socrates, or something, according to this book, according to canon law, or it could be according to that which obtrudes, uh, and that which can be tested by a variety of people and appears to be independent of where they are in the outcome appears to be independent of where they are so that certain observations which are appearances of the senses became known later as facts and some specially distinguished as facts in the scientific sense and it is these exemplars, because nobody claims they're more than exemplars, that are used to support either by accumulating evidence or by a mixture of deduction from accumulating evidence. The um, hypothesis which you've already given and is for the moment held stable that is to say, the thesis in the dialectic cycle. Um, the part which induces, in the older parlance, induced the hypothesis, namely the production of the antithesis and the creation of a synthesis, if achieved, and if so, maybe of several kinds, uh, is now left out one is only concerned with supporting, with evidence, either of opinion or scientia, that which is already posed. Now, this became even more so exacerbated by the development of probability theory, when induction became even more impoverished to mean probabilistic induction, as to say, induction using Bayes' rule, and the notion of repetition having a particularly significant effect and about inferential procedures based upon assuming certain prior things, assuming certain possible outcomes and proceeding in this manner and supporting an hypothesis generating the probabilities and the, and the, uh, and the outcomes and the entire structure insofar as it's uh, the evidence tallies with uh, the evidence tallies with that hypothesis. Um, it has rather forgotten actually the fact that of course the test procedures were socially agreed before they became scientific facts and that the hypothesis was accepted into at least one school of scientific research or else was the generator of another school which proved uh, viable, I don't mean alive, but viable I think is a perfectly good word probably. Now, the situation, the word had degenerated, the word induction had degenerated so much, it lost its original meaning so much by the time that one was 
Charles Peirce was about 1850, wasn't he? And he coined the term abduction to uh, cover this contingency. And wasn't it Spearman, your friend was saying, who used the term eduction later? I didn't know that. To cover the same psychologist guy, psychologist guy who was around. Well, nice chap. And he, um, it, it, I think it's Spearman, I looked it up later, and it seemed very, it was very intriguing. And these words, which are in effect uh, used for the same thing, correspond to the creation of the uh, antithesis, the opposite, and the achievement of possible the synthesis, and of course, since the synthesis presumably replaces the thesis, uh, the invention of the hypothesis in the first place. And it needn't be incidentally confined to a, an hypothesis which is invented, it could be a postulate which is uh, the existence of something rather than the existence of some rule. You're saying the invention of a hypothesis mm -hmm. or the formation of a Yeah, but you see, induction used to mean that as well. I mean, it isn't that the ancients were ignorant of invention. I mean, they, they just used... The, they, when older authors talk about induction, and I only hope when some of the artificial intelligentsia talk about induction, um, they are presumably addressing the question of induction in the old way, that there is induction of hypotheses, and there is it, the use of an inductive inference method, such as Bayes' rule to given prior probabilities, get a posteriori ones, um, to um, support hypothesis that's already invented. Well, the word it actually has degenerated, usually into meaning very little, excepting support from exemplars, and later on, support by devious probabilistic arguments, which are extra hypotheses, uh, which use exemplars and their probabilities in order to give, to a large deductive chain, certain kinds of verification. And uh, this is obviously an incomplete usage of the word. So that when, uh, as a result, in order to patch up this lamentable uh, sort of dilution of the word or degrading of the word, uh, Peirce, I think, was the first to use induction, abduction rather, apologies. I mean, he felt it impossible to reinstate induction again. It had been so frequently misused, it was now part of the common parlance to think of induction as. People would even say, people do say now, even if you talk about induction, do you mean mathematical induction or do you mean probabilistic induction? Uh, 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 had you asked that, Thomas Aquinas, I think you would have said you were bonkers. Well, I'm sure you would actually, but on the other hand, the fact is that uh, uh, had you asked some similar kind of question intelligible in that particular age, it would have seemed absurd, and Abelard would have regarded it as in uh, again posed as an idiom proper to a particular period. Um, but it's the kind of thing people now do. And to remedy that, uh, and the reason Warren always emphasized this thing so much, of course, it, it, this is the essential bit of human argument, and certainly of human the creation, essential. bit of human yeah. argument. And I, I would hold, and I think he would hold, that it, it, it's essential, it occurs in every, every thought, every, every thought, every action, every whatever. Uh, that can be regarded as human. There are certain perfectly good actions, the reflex actions, fine. But we don't call those human, excepting in the sense that clearly you can have a blow eye in my, my in here and I will wink my eye. Uh, and it's human action and in the sense it's attached to what I call my body, inconvenient as a matter of convenience. Uh, and uh, you can condition me to do various things, and there are certain inbuilt reflexes. These are no longer when certain human actions, in the sense of psychologically or socially relevant actions, they're just, they are certainly socially relevant and psychologically relevant to know that you have, or other people have, certain reflexes, because you may, as a result, avoid bloomers and uh, maybe help them or something.
um, were getting shot. <laughs> Uh, because there are situations in which there's reflex release of uh, dangerous weapons and so on. And, uh, and in certain kinds of madness there are clearly quite a lot of these. The brain goes wrong in certain way. And so you're s saying that a hypothesis is induced in even the firing of a reflex? No, not in the firing of a reflex. I'm saying okay. taking a reflex okay. is out Something of the maybe. ballpark of intended human activity. Uh, this is something we know about is going to happen unless it's a broken human being. Right. Or else if we have specially trained somebody, in the case of a weapon, uh, we know it's going to happen because we have trained them. For somebody else trained that all people in that particular core are trained in this particular way. And uh, there are certain reflexes which are necessarily trained in this way. They can't really be called voluntary actions or human actions, excepting that they're executed by a piece of the limb any more than, uh, you know, I can regard um, twitching or something as a part of psychology and uh, shivering. That might be, I suppose, depending on looked into. But I get my point uh, that any, any conceptual activity going on whether it be called learning, decision, teaching, creating, um, inventing, recalling, whatever you want, um, I think involves personally, I'm not quite sure why I'm going to go quite this far, an abductive component. So I've never actually seen a learning I mean, it's a very difficult one to controvert. I, there are a couple of phenomena I have never been able to observe, I am quite prepared to believe in. And, uh, but I'd have to be convinced of it, <laughs> pretty hard, that learning occurs, any learning occurs, say, and a fortiori thinking, etc., etc. Uh, conceptual process, let's call it which doesn't have a component of discovery. Now, it may be inconvenient quite often to call this innovative or creative, because uh, the result of that particular piece of innovation or creativity does not greatly differ, and is not differently described in the current language to types of creativity that have frequently been made either by the same person or others. So, I'm not sort of being obsessive about the use of the word creativity, but I believe the vast importance that is ascribed to abduction is that I can see no evidence that at least abduction of this kind occurs whenever you have any of these things going on in any conceptual activity at all. Um, whether it be particularly useful or shared creativity, whether it's called a creative act, or whether it is of social consequence, whether it produces an invention or a beautiful object or whatever, or a beautiful poem or something, is a very different matter. Um, it may be entirely a, a novelty, uh, which is, is is never discussed or even appreciated fully. I believe that uh, conceptual events are replete with these curious singularities. Curious what? Singularities. They are essentially singularities. I think they're, they're the rule in conceptual activity, whereas in mechanical activity there's, they are seldom encountered and are considered quite rare. Uh, when they are, they're of great interest. Uh, for example, <coughs> catastrophes in, in structural members or uh, the equivalent singularities of catastrophes in, in, in spaces and so forth. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, the, uh, that I think that uh, this is the rule for, for, for conception. And another thing I never actually seen, of course, is a cognition that doesn't have a, a conation. Again, I'm prepared to believe in it, but you'd have to show me one, and I don't quite know how it could be shown. That it doesn't have a... Have a conation. I've never had a, a thought, for example, that doesn't have an emotion or an affect mm. attached to it. Yeah, that's why I sense the, uh, you know, the word conceptual. That's why I was using it, John, definitely. You know, you know what I find fascinating, Jeffrey, 
one of the things that coming back to him, given the fact that I love these Yaroslav Peloton books, the early church fathers had a continuing discussion about how to use language to describe the realities that they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the fundamental difference in terms of... Say that again, John. The, the early church fathers were faced with uh, what is the quote church? What is this experience that we collectively agree we have had that we had such a difficult time expressing to each other? And the, the early church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa and Basil, uh, uh, Nazian, and then on someone, they began to carry on a discussion at at least two levels. And one had to do with some of the profoundest thinking and what I will call epistemology that I had read. And the big distinction between the Eastern, quote, Eastern, in other words, the early church, which was the basic church, the Eastern church, and what developed in the West, I am increasingly convinced, had to do with their use of language. And in the East, they, they said absolutely out, it's called the apathetic approach. Namely, we have this gift of language that we really don't fully understand, and it's a remarkable thing, and it's embodied in our, in our, you know, in the beginning was the word. However, what we have decided is that the language is incapable of expressing, quote, reality. And if you read some of the way the early church fathers discussed the use of language, they went to great lengths to say the language is inadequate. Uh, anything that you might say about anything, take the Godhead. Uh, I can show you wonderful, sort of, it's prose poetry. Uh, God is good. No, God is not good. Uh, on the other hand, God is not not good. And what they end up doing, it's very interesting, what they end up doing is so freeing themselves from the strictures that I think we in the West are still trapped and witnessed your little example of 15 minutes ago, you see, that somehow it's describable. And I also have an intuition, by the way, that the reason that Aquinas died depressed is that he, you know, he devoted, I mean, it's the most incredible intellectual monument of all history. I mean, what this guy did... And, and then he ends up at the age of 52 saying, he, he goes into a blue funk. I'll, I'll finish my thought here in a minute. And he basically ended depressed. He was a depressed person when he died because he ended up saying, everything that I have written is dross. All right, now the early church fathers arrived at that conclusion at the very beginning and then that released them in their use of language. And I think this is an intuition of my part that this thing about abduction, you see, and this thing about creativity, uh, and I think one of the reasons that Pope's cybernetics in our current social milieu is having such a hard time, that I think fundamentally what cybernetics is saying is that, look, the language, the linguistics is inadequate. But given that that's what we have, let's begin with the fact of its inadequacy. Describe its inadequacy, whether we call it noise or this or that or any other thing. And then let's go on and use it. Or, but, hmm? to give it a twist, describe its adequacy. All right, describe its adequacy. But I think, you see, if you, you if you look at the difference, if you look at the difference in the, 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 the whole theological uh, processing of the church fathers in the East and beginning with Augustine in the West, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas, etc., there is a fundamental difference in how they approach the manipulation of language. And, and my intuition is that whatever is happening, what we call cybernetics, I think what we're coming to grips with is, and that what a lot of the, quote, paradigms of the Western thought process has built up this edifice of science does not want to face up to, is they're, they're like they're like Aquinas before the Depression. They're still slugging in there, and my God, the volumes of stuff that's coming out—it's valid. It, it appears to 
uh, account for certain kinds of behavior, but then there are these anomalies. But, but Mayor, can I ask a question first? Uh, yes. Before we go back to this, uh, since John and I share this mm -hmm. theological interest, uh, this notion of becoming free of language and worrying about the inability of language to capture what was desired to be captured. Now surely that must have been sort of a consequence of all the efforts that the Eastern theologians made to capture it. As I said, what you're claiming is that, 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 the, that the, all the arguments over creed structure, for example, mm -hmm. eventually led them to the conclusion that the, that the enterprise of creed structure was leading them nowhere. Because uh, they certainly spent a lot of time no, no, arguing no. about language I, and definition. I have to be careful here. Um, I, the word free may not be the right word. I mean, there's a tremendous realism on the part of the Eastern Church Fathers of this phenomenal, mysterious grip that language has on us. Well, they, they spent a lot of time searching for perfect and acceptable Okay, but now, but now and one of the continuing differences in the, in the, uh, in the way uh, an Orthodox Eastern Christian will approach, quote, mission, compared, say, to the Roman Catholics, and especially the Protestant, is that uh, the Orthodox are much more relaxed about, look, it's an experiential thing. I'll, I can show you quote after quote that no amount of learning your catechism or the doctrine or this is the way we say it is, there's a completely different approach to, quote, authority. You see, and basically, what the Orthodox has the utter confidence in is that, under the right circumstances, you too can have what is fundamentally an ineffable, undescribable experience. But the use of the language is important. In other words, we're not getting into uh, this kind of uh, Western interpretation of subcontinent of India, Eastern mysticism of sort of oh. Uh, I mean that uh, there's nothing. There's a difference. Well, of course, that's a misinterpretation. It is a misinterpretation. You're right. Eastern but, mysticism, uh, which is rich in language, it, it's tr terribly rich in language. Well, that's why I tried to word it the way I did. You know, a lot of the Western interpretation is that, uh, that the whole thing is so ineffable uh, that you sort of approach people in silence and somehow look in their eyes, and then something mysterious is going to happen. Or I don't know. I but I, I'm really interested because what I would, Jeffrey, I think that the, uh, this whole thing that Gordon keeps coming back to uh, in abduction as a creative act, your interest in, our common interest in language, there is something the way the early church fathers in the East up to about the sixth century dealt with language and trying to describe something terribly important that I think uh, holds some important well, information it's directly for us. relevant. I don't, yeah. I don't think that you and your reinterpretation of what is going on in a learning situation are dealing with any kind of new human phenomenon. I, think I don't think it's a particularly a novel one. I mean, in some sense, everything is new because I, I, I have to postulate the reasons that I will give and very definite reasons. I have to postulate in a sense that everything is new. Uh, in another sense, of course, a very common and understandable to both of us sense, of course it isn't new. I mean, it's the kind of thing that goes on, has uh, been recorded, is, is part of history. Is well, it's interesting cetera, to me how, really. much, how much you and uh, Heinz and uh, others who are trying to deal with this are, are pressed back to dis discuss the distinctions of Plato and Aristotle. Yeah. And, 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 at the center of your sure. has to, has to, efforts for description. Yeah. Has to. How can we come back to well, the, uh, the make it, I guess there was two stages. I mean, one way of putting it would be to say that I had a commitment at that point uh, already. I was doing cybernetics, right? I had a commitment at that point. One criterion on which I would be able to judge an adequate theoretical <laughs> stance is that it could. I will not say explain consciousness, uh, which after all struck me as the thing of prime importance in matters social and 
psychological, and for that matter, even in matters of a type I've suggested as belonging to horses on the one hand, or schools of thought and religions on the other. Um, the, this is not to say I could explain what it is. I don't think that necessarily an explanation would be a proper thing to do. But there was a commitment to produce a, a, a framework since the paradigm, the paradigms existing in psychology were, I say psychology here to cover a variety of studies, uh, and which had to be abraded, uh, had to have their epicycles tuned uh, with adaptive machines and what have you. And this seemed to be pretty universally true. I mean, for example, apart from these um, often military studies or military funded studies, which had a pure research aspect, there were a large number of studies uh, on, for example, the sociology of traffic.